Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for coming along tonight. I want to begin by recounting an exchange that occurred in Senate estimates late last year. Senator Kim Carr was questioning uh, one of the legal officers from the Immigration Department, and he said, is it illegal to seek refugee status in this country? It is not, Senator. It is not illegal to seek asylum? No. So if you arrive by boat and seek asylum, how can you be illegal? She replied, it is in relation to your mode of entry in terms of the Migration Act. Another senator chips in, why wouldn't you use the term unlawful? Response. The Migration Act does in fact use the term unlawful. You are an unlawful non-citizen when you enter without a visa. I haven't heard the term unlawful non-citizen used. And the response from immigration, it is common parlance in the Migration Act, but basically the minister has indicated that the terminology we should use is illegal maritime arrival. So it is a directive from the minister to use the word illegal. Terminology matters because it shapes our understanding of any phenomenon. And describing people who arrive here by boat in search of asylum as illegal or illegal maritime arrivals certainly creates the perception that they have broken the law and therefore deserve to be treated as criminals. And if you follow that logic through, then as Julian was indicating, it explains why there is public acceptance of so many of the harsh policies that are currently being implemented. <coughs> But under international law, it is not a crime to seek asylum from persecution and other forms of serious harm. In fact, it is the right of every individual under international law. And in fact, Article 31 of the Refugee Convention, the very provision that the government invokes to support its use of the word illegal, prohibits countries from imposing penalties on asylum seekers who arrive without documents. The, the, word it, or the term it uses is on account of their illegal entry or presence. So the Refugee Convention effectively says that actions that otherwise would be illegal are not to be treated as such when somebody comes here in search of asylum. It's a bit like saying an ambulance can exceed the speed limit which is normally unlawful or illegal, if, they are, if an ambulance is driving to try and get someone to hospital to save their life. And of course, the reason why refugee law has this carve out is precisely because the governments that drafted the treaty back in the 50s recognised that if you are fleeing from persecution, then first of all, you might not have a chance to go home and pick up your passport. Secondly, you may not have a passport because if you are in fear of your own government, you are very unlikely to want to go to officials and, and try and say, I'd actually like to leave the country and could you please give me the documents I need to do so. And furthermore, uh, governments like Australia are going to be very hesitant to grant a tourist visa to somebody uh, currently in Syria or Iraq, even if, there were, even if they could find where they're supposed to go to actually apply for such a visa in the first place. So, and the final point I'd make is that the, the international treaties on um, people smuggling and trafficking also have a carve-out provision where people are seeking asylum. So, contrary to what we hear, um, people smugglers are not, you know, there, there's nothing in those treaties that actually prevents uh, people from, from seeking asylum. They must be read consistently with international refugee law. The other point to note is that by definition, somebody isn't a refugee until they've left their own country. So you can't actually go and apply for a refugee visa while you're still at home. Necessarily, refugees are people who have already crossed an international border. Sometimes people say, well, why is it that asylum seekers and refugees destroy their travel documents before they get here? Sometimes this is because people smugglers um, tell them to do so. Uh, and they destroy them at sea. And sometimes asylum seekers might destroy their documents themselves because it's much easier for a country to turn you around very quickly if you've got identity documents with you. And they fear, rightly so, that they may not have a chance to articulate their protection claim before they are removed. And others might fear that if they can be identified quickly, then that will place their family members at home at greater risk. <clears throat> 
So why do people come to Australia? This is one of the other myths. Julian alluded to it. Uh, this this idea that Australia is the you know the land that everybody is trying to get to is that actually the case? Well, what we know from the research is that the details of a country's asylum policy, including deterrence me mechanisms, have very little influence on the on an asylum seeker's choice of destination. For instance, Hazaras from Afghanistan who were interviewed said that they understood the risks of employing people smugglers and the risks of getting on a boat and coming to Australia. But given the threat of persecution by the Taliban and the general insecurity at home, the cost-benefit analysis clearly favoured uh, getting on the boat. Since every choice that an asylum seeker makes involves risk, it should hardly come as a surprise that asylum seekers don't respond to deterrence mechanisms, to threats of danger, to detention and to deportation in ways that policymakers in countries like our own might think they, they do. A number of years ago, Human Rights Watch interviewed refugees who came to Australia by boat to try and find out why it was that they didn't just stay in Indonesia or Thailand or Malaysia and instead made that risky journey by sea. The most common reason given then was that those countries didn't have a legal framework that could provide them with protection. Somali refugees, for instance, said that protection meant a lot more than just finding safety from the immediate threat that prompted them to leave their homes. Rather, it meant finding somewhere that they could rebuild their lives and secure their wider needs and work towards having a normal life. International law itself doesn't require refugees to seek asylum in the first place they reach. If you look at the countries in Australia's immediate vicinity and the travel routes that asylum seekers take, it's readily apparent that those en route from Iraq or Sri Lanka or Afghanistan can't claim protection in any country that they pass through. This is because they don't reach a country that has ratified the Refugee Convention unless and until they get to Australia which makes accessing protection very challenging. And I should note, given the um, current uh, proposal to have a, a resettlement deal with Cambodia, the mere fact that a, that a country has ratified the Refugee Convention in and of itself does not automatically mean that effective protection is forthcoming. Is Australia being flooded with asylum seekers? Well, now there are around 51.2 million displaced people in the world. This figure was released by the UN Refugee Agency earlier this year, and they said this is the highest number of people on the move since the Second World War. Not all of that 51 million, though, are refugees. Some of those people are displaced. In fact, many millions of those people are displaced within their own countries. Others are people who are uh, returning or who are still in search of protection. But the one thing that we can be sure of is that not all of them are heading to Australia. And this is, of course, despite the fact that so many polls suggest that uh, Australians think that they are being inundated by waves of refugees. This is the language we see being repeated by floods. Um, and, and yet the evidence just shows that's not the case. In reality, Australia receives a very, very small number of the world's asylum seekers, whether we consider that in absolute terms or on a, a per capita basis. So in 2012, which was the height of boat arrivals, we, we had 17,000 asylum seekers come here. And nevertheless, that represented only one and a half percent of the world's asylum seekers. On a per capita basis, we rank 69th in the world in terms of how many refugees we assist. And as Julian pointed out, if you compare the numbers of asylum seekers to the 190,000 permanent new migrants we accept each year, and then on top of that, another 100 or so thousand of uh, temporary migrants, you can see just what a tiny fraction of um, human mobility to this country this represents. The other important point is that immigration department statistics over recent years show that the overwhelming majority of people who are seeking asylum here by boat 
are in fact refugees, not the economic migrants that uh, we hear so much about. So what this means is that the risk of Australia breaching its non-return or non-refoulement obligations when it pushes back boats or tries to lure people home with repatriation packages is very, very real. In fact, immigration department figures show that in 2012 to 2013, where we saw that highest number of boat arrivals, 88% of asylum seekers were genuine refugees. And that was consistent with, with figures in the previous years as well. And there's, since there's been um, pretty much a processing freeze for the last couple of years, uh, we don't have up-to-date statistics. But what we do know is that of the, the cases that have now been processed in Nauru, again, 80 to 90% of those people have been found to be refugees. Yet there is still a pernicious idea that the right way to seek protection as a refugee is to wait overseas to be resettled. Resettlement describes the process of selecting and transferring refugees from a, a camp or an urban area where they are waiting, where they found kind of interim protection, although I use the word protection um, quite liberally there. And it's when a country like Australia agrees to take those people in as permanent residents. Countries, though, don't have any legal obligation to provide resettlement. So it's a, a wonderful humanitarian thing that Australia does, but we're not actually obliged to do it. And it's ironic then that this is the thing that Australians perceive as, you know, this is the right way to be recognised as a refugee. Even though as a matter of international law, Australia has more direct legal obligations to the asylum seekers who just turn up. At the moment, only 27 countries in the world offer resettlement programs, and Australia's is certainly one of the most generous, along with Canada and the United States. In uh, Last year, together, these three countries offered 90% of the world's resettlement places. But I should note that there are only around 80,000 resettlement places in the world, and you'll remember before that, that figure of people on the move, there are 11.7 million refugees in the world. So less than 1% of the world's refugees are resettled each year. The other point, of course, is that uh, UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency's resettlement process, doesn't work like the queue. It's, it's not like lining up at Woolies. A refugee's chance of resettlement doesn't mean that you, you start in a queue and you just wait till your, your turn comes, but it's more like a triage um, system like you'd have in hospitals. So you might have been there for five years, but someone turns up tomorrow whose needs are much more acute than yours. Who, they, they might be someone who's particularly vulnerable. Um, they might have a disability. And so they are prioritised in terms of their resettlement need. And the other uh, factor, of course, is that those who say refugees should simply wait for a place really need to look at the figures. So we now have almost 3 million Syrian refugees, most of whom are living in very rudimentary conditions in uh, Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey and Iraq. Almost a quarter of Lebanon's population now are Syrian refugees. And that would be the equivalent of Australia accepting 5 million refugees this year. What's fascinating is despite um, all the, the concern around um, Syrian refugees and now Iraqi refugees, with respect to the Syrians, only 21 countries have agreed to, to resettle them and they have said we'll take 33,000. So you've got 3 million displaced and 33,000 resettlement places in total. Australia promised to take 500 and like with the, the group that we are taking in from Iraq, that wasn't on top of the existing quota we'd set for the year, but rather within it. So it's clear just how illogical it is to suggest that refugees should wait somewhere else for protection to come to them. Australia's current policies exact uh, a significant human cost, but also a significant economic cost, as, as Julian's mentioned. The report earlier this year by the National Commission of Audit showed that since 2010, 
government expenditure on the detention and processing of asylum seekers has increased by 129% annually. Costs have skyrocketed from $118 million in 2009 to $3.3 billion in 2013. So this is the fastest growing government program with projected costs over the Ford estimates amounting to over $10 billion. Offshore processing on Nauru and Papua New in Manus Island in PNG costs Australian taxpayers 10 times more than if we allowed asylum seekers to live in the community while their claims are processed. So a comparison is it's $400,000 a year to hold one asylum seeker offshore versus $40,000 to let them live in the community um, even if we gave them financial assistance for basic living expenses and health care. So why do Australians tolerate this kind of expense and human cost on deterrence measures, particularly at a time when we are otherwise so concerned about fiscal rest uh, restraint? I think this is where those commonly held views that are at their heart erroneous come full circle. Because if you think that Australia is being overwhelmed by criminals who have no right to be here. And if you think they are taking the places of some people elsewhere who do have an entitlement to, to be here and that they are threatening our border security, or even if you think that we need to save people from endangering their own lives by getting on a boat, then you would accept, or many people seem to accept, these harsh deterrent policies and these very, very expensive measures. So what do we do? Well, I think, first of all, we need to recognise that there's no easy single solution. Refugee movements are, by their very nature, complex and messy, and desperate people will resort to desperate measures. But unilateral responses won't work, and we must take account of the broader global context. This means recognising that boats will continue to come as long as the root causes of displacement remain unresolved. This is a long-term challenge, it's always been with us, and it will remain for as long as there is oppression and discrimination in the world. Secondly, we need strong and responsible leadership. This requires politicians and community leaders to educate, to inform, and to appeal to our better selves rather than to the lowest common denominator. Thirdly, as citizens, we need to call our politicians to account. While any number of efforts at the international level might be mounted to draw attention to Australia's violations of international law, at the end of the day, Australian citizens need to demand more honesty and accountability from our own leaders. Fourthly, as lawyers, we need to ensure that Australia's international obligations and the rule of law are respected, rather than dismissed as irrelevant or inconvenient. Fifthly, and related to that previous point, we need to remember that having effective, fair and transparent refugee status determination processes are in fact the best way of ensuring that people who need protection can access it and those who don't need it can return home. Proper refugee status determination is not only the hallmark of an asylum policy predicated on the rule of law and obligations assumed under international refugee and human rights treaties, but because it is such a rigorous process, it can in fact be a deterrent in itself. Historically, Australia was recognised as having one of the best refugee status determination systems in the world, with well-trained decision makers, access to legal assistance and robust independent merits and judicial review. But this has been and continues to be increasingly curtailed. On the one hand, the government is pursuing enhanced screening mechanisms for Sri Lankans and plans to introduce a system of fast-track assessment and removal for asylum seekers generally which is focused on quick turnarounds rather than thorough procedures. On the other hand, of course, we've seen that asylum seekers have been left in the community and in offshore processing centres without any decision for two or three years. 
And I think given the, the recent um, issue of the 157 asylum seekers at sea, we may well ask, how is it possible to screen someone in half an hour on a boat, yet delay other outcomes for years? The former increases the risk of refugees being returned to persecution and other human rights abuses. The latter increases the risk of permanent psychological harm and the creation of a broken future citizenry. Finally, I think we need to insist that our treatment of asylum seekers and refugees is consistent with the values that we as Australians hold dear. So Australia's policies should ensure that durable solutions are available. And this doesn't mean that Australia becomes a soft touch, but rather that it walks the talk and respects the commitments that it's made to other countries under international law. And in doing so, regains its reputation as a rights respecting, tolerant country and as a nation that truly embraces the idea of a fair go for all. Thank you.